Hey everyone, it's me, Steve, and I am going to do a very long video, I apologize in advance, about the uh, Kohler Super Deep Borehole that was drilled on the western end of Russia near Finland uh, in the late 20th and early 21st century. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about this borehole. There's a lot of legitimate misconceptions about it and I'm going to address those at the end of the video but first here I'm going to show you which I'm going to address as my last point this lunatic urban legend that developed from this borehole uh, you just saw my comment at the bottom I'm not going to produce I'm not going to give any sound here I don't want a copyright strike even though it would be unjustified but look at this read what's on the screen I'm not going to link the video below. You can go look it up. You saw where it was. Um, this shot right here, this Dr. Azikov, I don't even know if that's a real human being. But just the misinformation in the introduction of this video was so overwhelming. And it was posted in 2009, more than 10 years after the urban legend first popped up. And people were still posting videos about this. And it just blows my mind just how people can just cling on desperately to something that's so ridiculous i will put some links below that show you kind of the history of the urban legend but that is not the focus of this all right what i am going to show you is i'm going to first show you how drilling works and as you go deeper in the into the crust i'm going to give you some background information about the cola super deep borehole i'm going to go through the stratigraphy of it with you the geology of it with you and then I am going to start addressing certain uh, parts of the uh, super deep borehole misconceptions that have arised and things like that. But anyway, I hope this video is informative and I encourage you to go out and look for yourself. But anyway, let's get started on this. All right, what you're looking at here on the right is a basic fact sheet about this uh, Cola super deep borehole. And uh, that's important and because for later in this discussion, when we get to the woo-woo part, um, the location's important. Remember where this is. I'm going to zoom in here slowly so you can see with uh, overlays all from Google Earth. They're all right there showing you as you zoom in to where this was located. It was barely in Russia. All right. And there's the location with the, you know, pin on it. And here it is really close there's the actual location in the upper left there and there you have the GPS I uh, in the lower right I copied it for you so you could look it up yourself actually if you type in Cola Super D borehole it'll take you right to it all right but before I get started I need to explain kind of how this hole was drilled and deep holes in general uh, this is just a cross-section uh, the drill rig is just an apparatus used I'm um, just to show you where the hole is going to take place because you have to drill using some sort of rig. It can either be on a truck mount, but this deep that's not going to happen, or it could be a structure inside a building. It doesn't really matter. None of this is going to be to scale. This is just to illustrate a point, all right? Now, what you saw was a very homogeneous looking interior of the earth. That's not how it is in reality. This is more how like it's going to be. This is not the cola specific location but it is typical of complicated continental uh, uh, areas and here you would have something like soft sediments this yellow uh, that stuff's going to be very easy to drill through all right um, here we'll just say you have hard sediments with an angular unconformity at the base all right uh, down at the bottom here, the green, purple, and uh, burnt red, you have a complex metamorphic rocks of varying hardness. Uh, you have very hard fractured rock, which is the purple. And you have things like faults. And as you can see here, some of the dotted lines indicate w would be bedding or metamorphic foliations or something. And in the yellow, the dashed lines would represent bedding. So I'm going to get rid of all of that. I just wanted you to see that the subsurface is not a simple layer cake or homogeneous unit. But it's going to cause confusion. So 
I'm going to get rid of all that here and go back to my oversimplistic model because, like I said, this is just to illustrate a point. When you drill into the earth very deep, you see here I have borehole red. This isn't what happens. You, you can't drill straight down. You may want to, but it's not going to happen. All right, that's not what happens. All right, so how is it more uh, conducive to reality? Well, basically, you would drill a larger initial hole. And I believe the cola off the top of my head was actually an 8-inch diameter. Um, and then you put your tooling down, your drilling rods, your bits, which are going to be a lot smaller than that 8. And you can go down fairly straight for a certain you know, depth, usually through soft sediments or very poorly lithified rock, you can keep a straight borehole. But eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get horizontal deviation. As you get deeper into harder and fractured and faulted deposits, your borehole is going to slowly angle off to a different direction. And sometimes this is intentionally done. It's called directional drilling. But I mean, for something like this, they wanted to keep it as straight as possible, but they really couldn't. So there was some horizontal deviation. In the later slides, you're going to see it show up, and you're going to see it come out, and then they tried to bring it back. Um, but it, it, it's always going to be angled. And although the cola is the deepest as of today, as I make this video, that we have ever drilled, it is not the longest borehole. So like I said, in directional drilling, you can intentionally do this. And you can go a lot further along the horizontal as opposed to the vertical, especially if you're drilling in something, say, a bunch of soft sediments that are a few kilometers thick. Um, it's a lot easier to go horizontally. And people do that when drilling for oil because oil fields will sometimes you'll go down and it'll dry out. But if you do a little bit of directional boring, you could hit another pocket of oil and gas and then you can uh, siphon off that without having to set up a whole new rig and drilling a whole new hole and some people actually kind of dishonestly do this if you will like, like if they own or leasing a property and they suck it dry they might just do a little directional drilling next door but anyway that's a topic for another time so when the horizontal deviation is intentional, it's called directional boring or directional drilling. And I've already covered that. And this just illustrates how you can intentionally do that or not intentionally. And as you can see here, the red within the gray, the gray hole represents your bigger hole. The thick red line would be where you're going straight down. And then as you go down and as you drill deeper, your tooling is going to generally become smaller. Like you may start out with a six inch drill bit. Or an 8-inch drill bit. And then as you go down, you're going to shrink that to a 6. And then you're going to shrink it to 2. And, you know, stuff like that. And especially if you're wanting to get cores, which they did get from the Cola Super Deep. Um, but basically here, this slide just shows you the borehole length. As you can see, it's longer than the uh, borehole's true depth. All right? But that's just nature. You can't... We can't fight that. We cannot go straight down. All right? Just... It's just the nature of our technology and everything. Technology is not a magic wizard. It's not infallible, and it does have its limits, as we are going to see later why they stopped drilling. Uh, the original target was 15 kilometers. They were at about 12.3 when they stopped, and there's a reason for that. And another thing you can do here is if you go down and say you're drifting, you get... Uh, a little bit of uh, horizontal deviation and you get stuck for some reason say you hit a pocket or you hit a very hard metamorphic layer that you, your tooling that you put down just can't get through or you hit something unexpected like you weren't looking for a pocket of gas but that's what you hit you can always either abandon that tooling in place or you can pull it out uh, and the abandoned one would be the purple here. And you can go down in a different direction. That's what this red is. So you can still use that basic straight down hole that you initially dug to, to redirect your uh, boring if, if you need to. All right, now I'm going to start getting into the Cola Super Deep specifically. But first I want to show you some generalized geologic maps and tectonic maps of the area of the borehole and their locations. These are all from journals which will be sourced at the end. Um, these are in black and white. This one is in color, which is a lot better. 
so you can see just the general complexity of what they were drilling into. In my opinion, this was a poor location to try to reach the mantle due to the very complex geology, the metamorphic facies, the faulting, just the fractures, uh, you know, possible hydrothermal activity, all that stuff. They should have tried to drill this on what we call a stable craton area that doesn't have a lot of really complex folding, faulting, and stuff like that. Like uh, the Illinois Basin would have been a great place to do this, the north end of it. Um, sorry, that's cats in the background acting crazy. All right, here's another color map of it, a little more zoomed in with the uh, age of units and the basic type of lithology. Now remember, these geologic maps are zoomed out, so there's not a lot of individual detail you're not going to see individual formations on these now what i did here as you can see i adapted this from a journal geologic map that was a closed zoom in it was in black and white so i decided not just to cut it but to create this for you by overlaying it on google earth and here's the basic units i'm going to be talking about in throughout this presentation um, there's the location of the borehole, uh, the red cross and the yellow circle gives uh, basic strike and dip. Those are taken directly from the paper. Uh, the plunging sin form, or it's essentially a plunging sin climb, but it's often referred to as a sin form due to its extreme com complexity. And then we have the geologic uh, contact and the faults here. All right, now we are going to get into a generalized geologic cross-section of the Kola borehole. This was taken directly from uh, the uh, the USGS's publication. They, that's actually a very good publication. It's actually up here in the upper right, and it is available for download for free, so if you want to look at it, you totally can. Um, and as you can see here, I've highlighted in red the actual physical path of the Kola borehole. And remember, see, they got down straight to almost three kilometers then it started to deviate and at about um, 8,000 kilometers they tried to bring it back around and then they stopped at a little over 12, or 12 kilometers and as you can see here the overall structure is a plunging sin form or syncline structure on the Baltic shield the structure is the uh, pecky Pekinga complex, I guess is how you pronounce that. If I am pronouncing it incorrectly, I apologize. I can't find the pronunciation anywhere, so we'll say Pechenga. How about that? Pechenga. Um, in this publication, uh, they refer to SD3 as SG3, uh, but they also refer to uh, SG3 as well. Uh, the actual boring that got the deepest, remember I showed you you could go down, retool, and do all that stuff, start another hole. SG3 is the one that reached the deepest, and that's the one uh, most of this information is taken from. We have, here is just me simplifying the cross-section for you. The upper pe uh, pechenga, the lower pechenga, the uh, very pronounced unconformity, which is going to come up later in this discussion. Uh, which they assumed was something called the Conrad discontinuity, which a lot of geologists don't even think is a real thing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the Kola series here on the bottom, highly metamorphosed rock. And what you see up there is the LFZ, and I put what it actually is uh, the abbreviation of in the upper right. I am not even going to attempt to pronounce that. I am just going to call it the uh, LFZ, all right? Okay, now I am going to get into a stylized general uh, illustration of the lithology of the Kola Superdeep. This is very generalized. I repeat that. This is very generalized. This is not a very stratigraphically specific representation because I'm trying to represent 12 kilometers of boring on this slide. So... It is based off the actual logs themselves, all right? And on the bottom, you can see the general lithological units. Um, those are not going to change, and what you're looking at right now isn't going to change. But as I progress through the slides, some things are going to appear and disappear, because otherwise this would be so crowded, you wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it. All right, so just that's the general, uh, my representation of the Kola Superdeep.
Now, how do you read this? Well, on the left there, you go from zero to three kilometers and you come up here on the right and it starts at three, goes down to six kilometers and it comes back up to the next one to the right, starts at six and goes down to nine and then nine and then 12. So that's how you read this thing. That's all I wanted to show you. And the actual depth was 12,262 meters. I terminated it at 12,000 meters just because the lithology doesn't change in that extra 262 meters. So, all right, now, based off the cross section, what you just saw, we have the upper Pechenga, the lower Pechenga, and we have the Archean rocks as our main units. That's what's here in black uh, with the brackets, all right? What is in green are the grades of metamorphism. I put the actual or green here is the low grade metamorphism. I actually put the actual name of that type of metamorphism but i'm referring to it as low grade because that's what it is for simplicity purposes all right i don't want to because if i just uh you know do something like green schist facies of metamorphism most people aren't going to know what that means so below that we get into a green schist, the green schist uh metamorphies metamorphic facies which is low to medium and then we go to an amphibolite which is about medium to high at the top of the lower pechenga and then we have, we end with about that. But then as you get into the Archaea rocks, something interesting happens. And the squiggly lines represent definite unconformities. As you can see, you have the LFZ in red, which is actually a complicated shear zone full of faults and other type lineations in it. It's a very complex unit. But at that 6,900 unconformity, the squiggly line just above 7,000, that's what they thought was called the Conrad discontinuity. But um, they actually got into Archean rocks. And the purple here above that black line where it says brittle deformation, def brittle deformation dominated from about 7.5 kilometers to the surface. That means if the, as the rocks get pushed and shoved due to tectonics, they're more likely to break than bend. All right, then we have a transition zone right below that. And below 8,000, we get a very ductile deformation, which means the rocks are more likely to behave like fluids through tectonics over long periods of time. All right. Okay. Now we're going to start talking about this Conrad discontinuity. All right. Um, during drilling, this boundary was at a physical depth of 6,842 meters. The Conrad discontinuity was what was not what they predicted. Okay, the Conrad discontinuity was showed up on seismic reflections. It's not consistent throughout the continental crust. It varies from location to location. Um, so it, it, in some places, it's absent altogether. And when this concept of this discontinuity first came about, I believe it was 1925 that this, that, that this discontinuity concept came around. All right. Now, remember, this started to be drilled in the year 1970. So we're probably a little more than a decade into the theory of plate tectonics. Well, based off of the old information, at this discontinuity, they expected to find basalt under the Pechengan rocks, but they didn't. What they saw was a change in metamorphic facies and a change in lithology. All right. And actually, what was drilled into reinforced the concept of, of plate tectonics because in plate tectonics, there's absolutely no reason for basalt to be underlying the continental crust. They assumed that before we developed the theory of plate tectonics because the ocean is basaltic and the continents tend to be more granitic. So they just thought, well, these granitic rocks just laid on top of basalt you know, extend the oceans under the continents. Well, that's not what they found. And in a plate tectonic regime, what they actually drilled into is what you would expect. But at the time, it was unexpected, all right? They were, they were kind of caught off guard by that a little bit, but, but it was no big deal. It was just more information to confirm an existing theory. All right. Here I have added in blue... Um, some ages of these rocks in billions of years. That's what GA means, right? Um, and, or the age of a metamorphic event. And these crossed black and white horizontal lines, those are showing um, 
uh, prominent shear zones. Now, a shear zone is kind of like a healed fault, if you will. Um, it's the best way I can think of to describe it simplistically. Now, like I said, there's already unconformities here, and some of these unconformities are actually faults. But I did this to show you the complexity of the geology that was encountered in this borehole, to show you that it wasn't just a simple, oh, let's drill into the earth until we hit the mantle. Um, there was a lot of things in the way that, that well, now we see this as typical. We, there's no reason why we, sh we wouldn't see something like this. But at the time, it was new information. Uh, I'll let you read it in detail if you want. Um, but what you see here is you'll see like 40 degrees with this, cert with this dot with a line. That is the typical dips for that unit. Now, when you drill in and it, down into the earth and you get a two-inch core, um, you'll see sometimes you'll see dip on the rocks and they can measure that dip. They can't orient that dip like they can't get a strike off of it, but they can tell you the dip. And in the in the upper parts, the upper Penjanga, um, you got about 40 degree dips. As you start to get to the LFZ, it increases right above there to about 50. Then in the LFZ, it's like 60 to 70. And then below that, you start to get foliations and dips of about 70 to 80 degrees, but below what they call the Conrad uh, disconformity, um, which showed up on the seismic reflections but wasn't what they thought it was, the dips and foliations kind of level out a little bit. They, they're about 20 degrees in the Archean rock. And as you go deeper, they slowly increase to about 50 degrees. And when they did the seismic reflection... Seismic reflection is very good for getting you a picture of the interior of the Earth. Um, at the time they drilled this, it was seismic reflection was just getting good, uh, but it wasn't as good as it is now. But you can get you can pick up things like general shapes and stuff like that. Um, you, but until you physically drill down like they did, there is no way you are ever going to know exactly what is down there. You have to physically drill to do that, and that's what they did. Okay, now that I have given you more than ample information about the Cola Superdeep, I'm going to start getting into the misconceptions, myths, and flat outright insanity associated with this. Okay, I'm just going to do five claims. The fifth one's going to be back towards what I showed you in the very beginning, the, int the introduction, that weird video clip. But anyway, let's get to the more sane misconceptions first. Claim one, the Cola Super Deep Borehole was never drilled, it was a hoax, most of the money went to dark projects. Um, that is flat out right false, for many reasons. Uh, you can go visit the structure, but a structure doesn't necessarily mean anything happened. Well, we kind of have the cores. This photo in the middle with the red arrow shows you the, it looks like a 2 inch core, 10 foot run, uh, which is standard, apparently... Uh, I mean, most people think of metric, but apparently from the look of that core box, uh, it might have been, uh, yeah, it looks like a standard 10-foot core run, 2-inch diameter. Uh, they must have been using standard uh, type equipment. Uh, off to the left here, we actually have the rock from near the bottom of the hole. And on to the right here, you can actually go visit the core repository in Russia if you want to, in the town of Zapolinary, I believe that's how that's pronounced, and look at the cores for yourself if, self if you want, all right? Now, at the bottom here, it says, out of the 12,262 meter deep borehole, bore <laughs> 9,325 meters was cored. Out of the 9,325 9, meters, 3,700 meters of the core was recovered. All right. Now, when you drill down and you want to get core samples, which is what that red arrow in the middle is pointing to, you, you drill with the bit and then you put a core barrel down and you get this, this rock sample. Um, you always want to try to get as close to 100% recovery as you can. The fact that they got 40%, that's poor recovery by anybody's standards. And the reason why they got such poor recovery was because of the nature of the rock that they encountered. Like I said, they would have, if they had done this on a stable cratonic area, they would have got so much better recovery. But this is, this entire area is faulted. It's full, uh, some of the rock is poor, some of it's very dense, and it's just not going to core easily, and you might have to drill past it to get through it. Uh, fractures, you know, uh, yeah, things like that 
attributed to this low recovery. But they got a lot. I mean, <laughs> as you can see from the core repository picture on the right, that's a lot of rock core. And I don't know, they probably didn't do two inches all the way down. Uh, my experience from looking at rock cores, deep ones, and uh, is that they tend to go, they tend to get smaller the deeper you go. Um, but like uh, the St. Amore core in the Upper Peninsula starts out, I believe it's a three inch diameter core and goes down to a two inch. Uh, obviously, it's nowhere near as deep as this, but it was still a deep borehole. All right, claim number two drilling was stopped shy of the 15 kilometer goal for ominous reasons. And I say ominous because that could be anything from, oh, uh, the, the money was cut to divert somewhere else or. You, or, you know, something like that. Not necessarily woo-woo type ominous, but just ominous. Like, or, or they hit something that they just couldn't go through, and instead of admitting it, they, they just cut it short. But um, th that claim is totally and utterly false. Here's what actually happened. As they started getting deeper into the crust, they predicted, you see the graph here on the left, I put the yellow circles with the red crosses in them. And I put the temperatures encountered at about that depth in degrees Celsius. The one on the right here is the red line is observed thermal gradient average. That means what they actually observed in the borehole. The blue is the predicted thermal gradient. And as you can see, the predicted thermal gradient at 12 kilometers is only about 100 degrees Celsius. What they actually encountered was about 180 degrees Celsius. Now, that's only 80 degrees more, but it's a lot more than they expected. And if we extrapolate the observed thermal gradient down to 14 kilometers, the temperature would be about 270 to 300 degrees Celsius. Um, as where the extrapolated predicted gradient would only have been about 140 degrees Celsius, which they were already past at the 12 kilometer mark. So that is why they stopped. These higher temperatures that they encountered, their equipment just wasn't built for that. Now they came up with some great innovations during drilling this, but like I said before, Technology is not a magic wand, all right? You, you are limited by the physical capabilities of the materials you are using to accomplish your goal. And they feared they were near exceeding that. And if you look up the core hole history, you'll see sometimes it was stopped. The actual boring was stopped in 1992, and other times you'll see 94. Uh, the, the 92, they stopped temporarily to assess the situation, and they might have tried a little bit deeper, but by 94, they gave up. They actually drilled the vast majority of this 12-kilometer depth in the 70s through the 80s. And after, um, after 94, they had some people come in, look, look at it, and they decided it was infeasible, and they shut it down in 2006 and abandoned the site in 2008 altogether. Claim three, deep liquid water proves that liquid water extends down to at least the mantle. I've seen this in many places. They encountered water at several depths, and I'm going to explain in detail why here at several points and read the slide to you. But first, I just want to say it's not unusual to find water deep in the crust. We know this. This uh, At the time, it was kind of unusual for the depth they were at, uh, but you know, like I said, they really didn't understand things like we do even these 30 years later, right? So this claim that liquid water extends at least down to the mantle is just a misconception all the way because uh, although minerals at great depth just go to the mantle for, for a minute, uh, hydroxis minerals can exist. That It's not like there's caverns of big, huge oceans and lakes under there. That That's not what's going on. All right, let's address these points. There's six of them. All right, this cannot be assumed since the borehole only reached one third of the way to the continental through the continental crust. Okay, groundwater is common even in deep rocks. Although local surface-fed aquifers do not usually go more than several kilometers, and the cola surface water influences groundwater down to at least two kilometers and possibly as deep as four kilometers. I'm not going to get into aquifers and aquitards here in a hydrology lesson, but um, basically what this says is that you had. Uh, uh, pervasive flow from the surface down into deeper depths, which most people get their drinking water from groundwater. We just don't usually have to drill, you know, kilometers down to get it. All right. Three, shallow groundwater is fed from the surface through abundant joints and fractures in the rock. It is likely that some of the shallow water has been down there for at least 15 to 300 million years based on helium and argon dating. So th this 
uh, water from four kilometers up really wasn't unexpected, all right? The shallow and deep groundwater appeared to be separated by a zone of low porosity that lacks fractures from about four to five kilometers. Basically, that's your barrier. That's a lithological unit where groundwater isn't going to permeate through to lower depths. All right, that, that's, I'm just going to leave that there. All right, deep groundwater, however, below that impermeable aquitard, if you will, from about 6.8 to 7.5 kilometers, appears to be relic to water. All right. It's either present when it was either present when the rocks were initially deposited or derived from the minerals in the rocks themselves or injected from below uh, by hydrothermal activity. It, it is likely a combination of these factors. Pervasive flow is essentially non-existent at this depth and appears to be dominantly closed system. Well, what's that mean? That means there's not a lot of lateral uh, uh, or vertical groundwater flow that they encountered at this depth. And the water seems to be, doesn't seem to be being fed from anywhere. That doesn't mean there isn't some hydrothermal activity that could be heating water deeper in the rocks and freeing it up a little bit, or the, the hotter temperatures are reacting with the minerals in the rocks. That could still be occurring, but it's not exposed to the surface. The, the surface groundwater is not influencing the system. All right. From about seven and a half to eight kilometers, brittle deformation gives way to plastic deformation. And I showed that in a previous slide when I was showing my lithology of the core hole. There is no evidence for groundwater deeper than nine kilometers and arguably no deeper than eight kilometers. There was no groundwater significantly into the Archean. They did not, uh, now at the, uh, the Conrad discontinuity, the Archean below that was fractured and there was water there, but once they got deeper into those Archean rocks, there was no water. They were dry. So the claim that this coal was just bubbling with water at every depth at every though it's it's just false. It's flat out right false. All right. Claim four, microorganisms have been found above the expected Conrad discontinuity at about 6.7 kilometers. This one's a bit more ominous. False-ish? Okay. Now, before I get into these points, I want to say we do know from deep drilling that microorganisms can exist deep underground. We've known this for a little while now. Uh, that's not unusual. Um, we know that you drill deep, you can find things like fossils <laughs> deep in rocks underground. We have encountered this many times as well. So that's not really bizarre. What is bizarre is I have been unable to locate Cola super deep borehole specific papers on the reported microorganisms found at this level. What that means is, now although I can find tons of literature on deep fossils and microorganisms and fossils and microorganisms at depth, I can't find any specific to the Cola Super borehole, at least not in English. All right, and I'm not gonna learn Russian just to read a paper, okay? So if anybody has any actual site-specific studies done on these suspected microorganisms, please let me know, because as far as I am aware, it's all reported through the media. And according to these reports, 24 species of fossilized plankton have been found down to about a depth of 6.7 kilometers and no deeper. All right, so, so it's not like they got all the way down to 12 kilometers and we're finding microbes thriving and living. These are fossils from, you know, per legitimate, or per verifiable media sources, all right? Some media sources have falsely claimed that these fossils were either still living or found embedded in the granite. Both of these claims are blatantly false. There are no microorganisms in actually physically in the granite. That, that's not a physical pop, a possibility. It's due to the nature of how granite forms, all right? There are no granitic rocks above the 6.9 kilometer mark. Uh, they start to really, they're really prevalent in the Archean, okay? And they're metamorphosed, but the, the parent rock's granitic. The reported fossils, not living organisms, appear to have been found only in hydrocarbons coating the fractures in the bedrock. Hydrocarbons and microbial life are known to be present in some deep rocks since at least the 1990s, all right? And like I said, the only information I could find about this was through media sources. And here's a link to a more sensible one below. Some of them are just flat out right left, like 
way out left field. It's ridiculous and makes no sense. So I just wanted to cover that. Now we're going to get into the final claim here. The fifth and final claim that I am going to address and my favorite is the sounds of hell were heard from the bottom of the boring, bizarre, wacko, nutter stuff. And this ties into that clip I showed you at the very beginning, okay? And I have given you more than enough information here about the Cola Super Bowl hole that you should be able to look at any of these videos you might see from now on and just immediately dismiss them because there's so much misinformation in those type of videos, it's ridiculous. There's conflicting stories about how this got started, if you will, this this myth, this urban legend. But um, here's what we do know based on what was actually accomplished. The so-called well to hell is an urban legend. The claims are that at the bottom of a 14.5 kilometer borehole in Siberia and temperatures were at least 1100 degrees Celsius at the bottom. Um, no well anywhere near that deep was ever drilled in Siberia. People are confusing it for the Kola borehole. And sometimes they'll actually say Kola borehole, but they'll say it's in Siberia, which is on the other side of Russia. All right. The Kola is about as far from Siberia as you can be and still be in Russia. All right. As we have learned, the Kola borehole only reached a depth of about 12.3 kilometers. Of course, once this was realized, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, 1989, quickly assigned the well to hell to the Kola Peninsula as not to get caught with their pants down on a bullshit story. And bullshit is the only way to describe it. I guess this Trinity Broadcasting Network was the first one to broadcast these uh, uh, sounds of hell from the deep, if you will, which is a total hoax. Uh, but as you can see, they, they got caught, they, they, they twitch it, they, they stuck it to its proper location in order not to get caught with their pants down. Yet people, as you saw from that beginning intro video, <laughs> 20 years later, were still claiming this thing was in Siberia. All right? The bottom temperature was measured at 180 degrees Celsius, a far cry from the claimed 1,100 degrees Celsius, or for those of us on this side of the pond, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, about. There is audio of the supposed screams, a.k.a the Siberian hell sounds, at the bottom. The audio is a known fake, and no reports of screams have ever been recorded at the Kola drill site. Hydrogen gas was discovered in the borehole and is likely the uh, source of the embellished story behind the bursts of luminous gas cloud that supposedly turned into a demon. <laughs> All right, that's part of this urban legend. They did hit hydrocarbons, um, or did hit some hydro, actually hydrogen sulfide when they were drilling, and that somehow became a demon with wings rising from the hole. Uh, no demon manifestations have ever been reported by any drillers. The hydrogen gas was neither luminous or a cloud. It was the smell of hydrogen sulfide emanating from auger cuttings as pockets of gas were encountered underground. That's all it was. And... Like I said, without getting into why this urban myth was started, because stories conflict, I just want you to be aware that now that I've given you a detailed description of the Kola borehole, right, its lithology, what was actually encountered, what was expected in as short of time span as I could, now you are better armed to defend against such blatant stupidity as these type of claims. All right, but um, uh, just this here is just a picture of the capped hole at the actual site. But um, anyway, that is it. Uh, if you want to, please leave comments below. I will answer any questions to the best of my abilities. Uh, and I hate to do this, but the way YouTube's been lately, if you're not, could you please subscribe? And I hope you learned something.